So now, starting where we left off, we're going to first, of course, entitle our next flowchart angiosperms5. And we are still talking about that very complicated, very complex life cycle. So we'll just subtitle this, the life cycle continued. Okay, so the good thing is we've gotten the sort of difficult part out of the way. We've created the female gametophyte. We've looked at how the male gametophyte forms as well, both of which are simultaneously happening within the same plant structure. Don't forget that. We have male and female parts that are distinct to each other. Now, the next logical step is once you've developed both of these, you're going to undergo something known as pollination. Now, I want to make this very, very clear. Pollination and fertilization are not the same thing. We'll actually have a separate flowchart for fertilization. We'll see exactly what pollination means when we look at the specific steps associated with this process in the angiosperms. So, first and foremost, pollination is going to involve the fact that pollen grains, you should be asking yourself, where are these found? Male, female, what type are they? Gametophyte, sporophyte. Pollen grains are, of course, male gametophytes that are going to be released from the anther. So that's where they originate. That's where they develop, and that's where they release from. So they released, are released from the anther, and there are then going to be carried away. So then they are carried and when we say carried, we mean either by, you know, a wind dispersal mechanism or even an animal-mediated mechanism to carry these uh, pollen grains away from the original plant um, and then eventually towards the end goal. The pollination goal is to get to that sticky stigma. And once you get there, you can begin a fertilization event. So we start at the anther. We want to get to the sticky stigma. How do we do that? We either use the wind or an animal. We hitchhike on an animal and figure it out from there. Okay. Now, one thing I want to make clear is that this is essentially the story that happens in plants that don't self-fertilize, that have cross-fertilization. Some flowers, though, I want to make this sort of clear, is that there is the capability of some flowers um, that self-pollinate. So this is certainly possible, but of course what we'll see is that there are some implications to this, and specifically in regards to genetic variation when you self-pollinate, things might not be in terms of variation that quite, quite variable because you're using the same genes over and over and over again, though of course they're through meiotic divisions and meiosis produces you know separate independent new haploid gametes. Nonetheless, it's still going to result in a self-pollination event that's going to sort of conserve genes within the same gene pool instead of spreading them out. Now, the idea is that pollination is a critical part in allowing for cross-fertilization. This example right here, this sort of scenario, is, is sort of tied to the fact that cross-fertilization is going to happen. Most plants, therefore, I would say most angiosperms, have a mechanism, M-E-C-H for mechanism, to actually ensure this happens. When I say this happens, I mean to ensure cross-fertilization happens. So that's actually a big part of their overall life cycle is to make sure that genetic variation is going to eventually result. Some of those techniques, those mechanisms that can be used is the fact that in some species, let's say, so this is an example, in some species, the stamen and carpels, both of which are distinct male and female parts respectively, the stamen and carpels, uh, of one flower actually may mature at different times. Of one flower may mature at different times. So if you have the maturation happening at different rates and thus completing at different times, you're never going to possibly have the pollen that comes from the stamen head on to the sticky stigma that's within that carpal structure and thus have fertilization, self-pollination, excuse me, and thus have self-pollination. It's not going to happen simply because sometimes the sperm is going to be fully developed and sometimes the egg is going to be fully developed. Sometimes the female gametophyte may not be developed and the male gametophyte is all of which is 
sort of uh, premised on the fact that we have different times, thus different maturations, thus different overall uh, points in which pollination can happen. And so, of course, you're going to have cross-fertilization. So the pollen will leave this plant, the egg will stay in this plant, and hope that a different pollen comes in at the right time and at the right moment. Okay, so that's one of our mechanisms. Um, in other species, we can say the following. So there's another mechanism to remember. The mechanism, of course, is to promote cross-fertilization. Don't forget that, to promote genetic variation. In other species, the stamen and the carpal, notice again we're explicitly mentioning both the male and female parts because they are directly involved in the fertilization, in the pollination, therefore. So in other species, the stamen and carpal are arranged, are physically arranged. So they're, they're morphologically arranged so that self-pollination can't occur. So that self-pollination cannot, can't occur. So that's just about morphology. So in order for this to happen, of course, we have to make sure that we have these mechanisms uh, in place to promote cross-fertilization. And overall, like I've been mentioning about four or five times now, the purpose of all this, this sort of going out of your way to make sure that you don't self-pollinate, is of course the idea of promoting genetic variation, which is very good, as we know, from all of our studies of evolution and natural selection and genetics in our previous look at those topics in Bio 115. So that's our mechanism story of pollination, specifically uh, making sure that cross-fertilization eventually happens. So what you can say here is that most have a mechanism to ensure cross-fertilization, which would actually mean they have a mechanism to ensure cross-pollination as well. Now, pollination is the precursor to fertilization, and if you can make sure that cross-pollination happens, you therefore can make sure cross-fertilization happens. Notice how I did that sort of uh, transition from pollination to fertilization. They're not the same thing, as we'll see. They are just sort of uh, one before the other. Pollination comes first. So what is pollination? Let's go over the steps. Uh, let's do the stepwise sort of arrangement of pollination as follows. So what happens is the following. We have a pollen grain, okay, and that's the male gametophyte. That pollen grain specifically lands. It has to land somewhere. And once it lands, let's say, at the sticky stigma region, it's going to uh, absorb water. It lands, it absorbs water, the reason why it absorbs water is because once water is absorbed, this is going to stimulate germination. So it stimulates germination. And we know that germination is basically the start of growth, the start of development, the start of something uh, that's going to be important in the overall reproductive life cycle. So we've concluded, we've sort of started by landing, absorbing, and germinating. Okay, so once that's done, what's next? So the next logical step is the tube cell. The tube cell, which is a part of the pollen grain, as we said before, the tube cell produces that ever so important, ever so critical pollen tube. And that pollen tube gets some direction, remember, from the female gametophytic, let's say, development because of those synergid cells that disintegrate and release those chemicals to give the pollen tube a nice direction of growth. So now we have a pollen tube that's been formed. So what is the pollen tube going to do? It's going to use those directions and do the following. The pollen tube coming from the tube cell, which is a part of the pollen grain, the pollen tube grows down the style. And remember, the style is that sort of structure that goes from stigma to ovary. It's sort of that highway, I like to think of it. That pollen tube is going to grow down this sort of laid down foundation called the style, this sort of roadmap. The style is going to go towards the ovary. Why do we want to go towards the ovary? Well, the ovary will contain the ovule, and the ovule will contain the megasporangium, and the megasporangium will have the megasporocyte, and that will have the megaspore, and that will have the female gametophyte, which is the egg. And that's where we need to get to, and that's what we're doing here. Okay, so we're growing towards the ovary. Now, the next part is a little bit different, something that we haven't mentioned before. As we're going through or towards the ovary, there's going to be a structure that we actually have to penetrate through. The pollen tube penetrates through a specific structure known as the micropyle. The micro P Y L E. So it penetrates through the micropyle. The micropyle is just going to be known as the following. So we'll just say the micropyle equals a pore in the ovule integuments. Pore in ovule 
integuments. Remember, integuments are just uh, tissue, sporified tissue that surround the ovule as protection, surround the seed eventually as protection. So there's going to be a pore, sort of an opening that the micro, that the pe that the pollen tube, excuse me, sort of pushes through and really goes towards into the ovule, and that is the micropile. So micropile pore that's going to lead us again closer and closer towards that structure that we need to get to, which is the egg cell. Finally, last step here for this video, we're going to have two sperm. I want to emphasize two, two sperm, two sperm cells. Remember, we did mitosis after developing that sperm cell uh, in the other side of the pollen grain. We have the pollen tube, and then we have the sperm cell that underwent mitosis to give you two sperm cells. Both of them are going to be discharged from this pollen grain structure. And what, is they, what are they going to utilize? They're going to utilize this nice pollen tube highway that's going down the style right towards and through the micropile into the ovary so that these are two sperm cells will ultimately be discharged directly into and near the female gametophyte. And that's where we'll stop our story of pollination because the next story, the next step in this growth and this life cycle is a separate step that's not pollination and that is fertilization as we'll see in the next video.